In the last few videos, we had gone over a single stage design. I'm going to summarize that and then we'll extend it to have multiple stages. So here's the single stage or single cycle process that we had designed previously, where every single cycle, the program counter advances to the next instruction or jumps to another instruction. Then you read out that instruction from instruction memory. The type of instruction is analyzed by this control unit, which then sets up all the remaining control signals. That allows every unit to accept inputs from the right place and send its outputs to the appropriate place. So I can distill that figure into this simpler figure over here, where I basically say that there is an instruction memory stage, there's a register file that has to be read, there is an ALU that does the number crunching, there's a data memory unit that brings values back and forth from memory, and then ultimately you're going to update the contents of the register file with whatever result was produced in this instruction. Okay, so if you look at which of these units need a clock, the program counter needs a clock. So at every rising edge, the program counter gets updated with the next instruction that has to be executed. Once that's updated, that PC feeds as input to the instruction memory stage, an instruction spills out of here, it then goes to the register file, you don't need a clock to read things out of the register file, so the register file produces the values at those locations, those feed as inputs to the ALU, so again there's no clock to the ALU, and ultimately the value that is produced by the ALU gets latched in this, in this register over here. Right? So this is a register that gets updated at every falling edge and it keeps track of the address that's going to be used for the load or the store from this data memory unit. So in this design, the entire instruction executes in a single cycle and I've tried to minimize the number of latches required over here. So I've made sure that the data memory unit and the instruction memory unit both have a latch that is preceding them. That allows them to have a stable input so they're only retrieving one value from the instruction memory or from the data memory. So the rising clockage, the PC is updated. That's a stable input so you can do all of this stuff in the next half cycle. Then at the falling edge, the value that comes out of the ALU gets latched in this register over here. That serves as a stable input for the remaining half cycle where I fetch something from data memory. And once a result has been produced from here or from the ALU, that value gets written into the register file at the next rising clock edge. Right? So at the very end of the cycle, whatever value was produced by this instruction gets written into the register file. Okay, so there are only three clock signals over here. One is to this latch over here, which is triggered by this falling edge over here. And then the program counter and the register file both update themselves at every rising clock edge. Okay, so now that we've designed this this processor that executes one instruction in one cycle, let's see how I can extend this to be a multi-cycle design. Okay, and that's what I'm showing you over here. I basically identified you know, five different tasks that have to be performed. There is the instruction memory from where you retrieve an instruction, then you retrieve operands from the register file, then you perform the math, then you may have to read or write something into or from data memory. And then ultimately, the result of this instruction may have to get written back into the register file. So there are five different steps that have to be performed. And I'm going to dedicate an entire cycle for each one of these steps. So in the very first rising clockage, this PC over here gets updated. And now I have an entire cycle in which to read something from the instruction memory unit. So I'm giving an entire cycle to bring something out and whatever value is fetched out gets written into this latch at the next rising clock edge. So at this rising clock edge, I'm basically writing something into this latch and I'm calling it latch L2. Now the contents of this latch serve as input to the next stage. And so that 32-bit instruction tells me what kind of instruction this is and what my register input operands are. Accordingly, those inputs go into the register file and the values in those register entries then come out. And again, I'm giving an entire cycle to perform this register read. So in this time over here, the register file gets read. At the end of that cycle, something has been produced, which gets latched into, into this latch over here. So at this rising clock edge, latch L3 keeps track of whatever was read from the register file. That's now a stable input to the ALUs in the next cycle. And now the ALUs have an entire cycle to perform their arithmetic operations. 
they produce a result which gets stored in latch L4 at the next rising clock edge. So at this point, L4 records whatever the ALU computation produced. Now in the next cycle, I have one entire cycle to read the data memory unit, produce a result which then gets stored in latch L5 at this rising clock edge. Then ultimately, whatever value was produced, either by the ALU or by the data memory unit, has been recorded over here. That has to be written back into the register file. And again, I'm giving an entire cycle to perform this operation. So at this point, at this rising clock edge, there is something being written into the register file. So you'll see that this entire operation takes about six cycles. These are six equal size cycles, even though it looks like I'm compressing things over here. But you'll see that this is cycle one, cycle two, cycle three, cycle four and then cycle five right so in those five cycles the instruction has moved from one stage to the next from one latch to the next and it has finally been completed after five cycles okay so this is how i take a single cycle or a single stage operation and break it up into five stages in this example next i'm going to pipeline this design and before i talk about that let me step away from an instruction flowing through circuits let me talk about a completely different analogy. So pipelining is best explained with this example of a car being manufactured in some factory. Let's consider first the unpipelined design where you have all of your workers, they're all kind of working together trying to build one car over here. Okay, so you have different people building the engine, the chassis, you know, trying to paint the car. All of this is happening at the same time. And it takes, let's say, 24 hours to produce one car. So 24 hours later, one car rolls out of this factory and then everybody starts to work on the second car, which is what I'm showing you here. 24 hours later, the next car rolls out and so on. What I'm showing you in the design below is the standard assembly line that is so popular in, um, in modern industry, where you take that one large task of building a car and break it up into three completely independent stages. The first stage involves a team that's only trying to build the engine, right? So this is where I build my engine. The second stage is a different group of people that takes that engine and then surrounds it with a chassis. So they're all they're doing is building the chassis over here. Then a third team comes in and takes over. And what they're doing is doing all the cosmetic stuff like adding seats, adding upholstery, painting the car and so on. Okay, so I've taken that one large task, which took 24 hours to do and I've broken it up into three different tasks and the, there are separate teams that specialize in each one of these tasks so team A takes about eight hours to build the engine the next team takes eight hours to build the chassis the next team takes about eight hours to do the cosmetic stuff okay so it still takes 24 hours to produce the car but you essentially have you know exclusive teams that do a certain task then hand over their work to the next team and so on what that allows us to do is while team B is working on the chassis for car number one, team A can start working on car number two, right? So there's a second car that's being produced at the same time. And team A is busy building the engine of car one, of, oh, sorry, of car two. And team B is busy building the chassis of car one. Then a few hours later, you get into this state over here where team A is building the engine for car number three. Team B is building the chassis for car number two, and Team C is doing the cosmetic operations for car number one. Okay, and so it still takes 24 hours to build a car, but you've increased the level of parallelism. That is, there are multiple teams all working together and working on different cars at the same time. What that allows you to do is it increases your overall throughput, right? So in this first example here, there was one car rolling out every 24 hours. That was my throughput. The throughput here is one car every eight hours, right? Because there's a car rolling out here, there's a car rolling out over here and here and so on. And this gap is the length of one of these pipeline stages, which is eight hours. So the throughput here is three X higher than the throughput here. And that's because I've broken up one task into three pipeline stages. Okay, so clearly this is better in terms of throughput. It's kind of the same in terms of latency over here. Okay, and now let's move away from the SCAR analogy and let's go back to instructions flowing through the circuits on, on a processor. 